that even in the lowest form of life the entirely living nexus is canalized into some faint form of mutual conformity. Such conformity amounts to social order depending on hybrid prehensions of originalities in the mental poles of the antecedent members of the nexus. The survival power, arising from adaptation and regeneration, is thus explained. Thus life is a passage from physical order to pure mental originality, and from 17 This account of a living personality requires completion by reference to its objectification and the consequent nature of God. CF Part 5 CH 2. 108. Discussions and Applications. Pure mental originality to canalize mental originality. It must also be noted that the pure mental originality works by the canalization of relevance arising from the primordial nature of God. Thus an originality in the temporal world is conditioned, though not determined, by an initial subjective aim supplied by the ground of all order and of all originality. Finally, we have to consider the type of structured society which gives rise to the traditional body-mind problem. For example, human mentality is partly the outcome of the human body, partly the single directive 165 agency of the body, Partly a system of cogitations which have a certain relevance to the physical relationships of the body. The Cartesian philosophy is based upon the seeming fact the plain fact of one body and one mind, which are two substances in causal association. For the philosophy of organism the problem is transformed. Each actuality is essentially bipolar, physical and mental, and the physical inheritance is essentially accompanied by a conceptual reaction partly conformed to it, and partly introductory of a relevant novel contrast, but always introducing emphasis, valuation, and purpose. The integration of the physical and mental side into a unity of experience is a self-formation which is a process of concrescence, and which by the principle of objective immortality characterizes the creativity which transcends it. So though mentality is non-spatial, mentality is always a reaction from, and integra. T on with, physical experience which is spatial. It is obvious that we must not demand another mentality presiding over these other actualities, a kind of Uncle Sam, over and above all the U.S. citizens. All the life in the body is the life of the individual cells. There are thus millions upon millions of centers of life in each animal body. So what needs to be explained is not dissociation of personality but unifying control, by reason of which we not only have unified behavior, which can be observed by others, but also consciousness of a unified experience. A good many actions do not seem to be due to the unifying control, e.g., with proper stimulants a heart can be made to go on beating after it has been taken out of the body. There are centers of reaction and control which cannot be identified with the center of experience. This is still more so with insects. For example, worms and jellyfish seem to be merely harmonized cells, very little centralized. When cut in two, their parts go on performing their functions independently. Through a series of animals we can trace a progressive rise into a 166 centrality of control. Insects have some central control. Even in man, many of the body's actions are done with some independence, but with an organ of central control of very high-grade character in the brain. The state of things, 
according to the philosophy of organism, is very different from the scholastic view of Saint Thomas Aquinas, of the mind as informing the body. The living body is a coordination of high-grade actual occasions, but in a living body of a low type the occasions are much nearer to a democracy. In a living body of a high type there are grades of Oka. The order of nature. 109 science so coordinated by their paths of inheritance through the body, that a peculiar richness of inheritance is enjoyed by various occasions in some parts of the body. Finally, the brain is coordinated so that a peculiar richness of inheritance is enjoyed now by this and now by that part, and thus there is produced the presiding personality at that moment in the body. Owing to the delicate organization of the body, there is a returned influence, an inheritance of character derived from the presiding occasion and modifying the subsequent occasions through the rest of the body. We must remember the extreme generality of the notion of an enduring object of genetic character inherited through a historic root of actual occasions. Some kinds of enduring objects form material bodies, others do not. But just as the difference between living and non-living occasions is not sharp, but more or less, so the distinction between an enduring object which is an atomic material body and one which is not is again more or less. Thus the question as to whether to call an enduring object a transition of matter or of character is very much a verbal question as to where you draw the line between the various properties, cf. The way in which the distinction between matter and radiant energy has now vanished. Thus in an animal body the presiding occasion, if there be one, is the final node, or intersection, of a complex 167 structure of many enduring objects. Such a structure pervades the human body. The harmonized relations of the parts of the body constitute this wealth of inheritance into a harmony of contrasts, issuing into intensity of experience. The inhibitions of opposites have been adjusted into the contrasts of opposites. The human mind is thus conscious of its bodily inheritance. There is also an enduring object formed by the inheritance from presiding occasion to presiding occasion. This endurance of the mind is only one more example of the general principle on which the body is constructed. This root of presiding occasions probably wanders from part to part of the brain, dissociated from the physical material atoms. But central personal dominance is only partial, and in pathological cases is apt to vanish. Chapter IV Organisms and Environment Section I 168J So far the discussion has chiefly concentrated upon the discrimination of the modes of functioning which in germ, or in mere capacity, are represented in the constitution of each actual entity. The presumption that there is only one genus of actual entities constitutes an ideal of cosmological theory to which the philosophy of organism endeavors to conform. The description of the generic character of an actual entity should include God, as well as the earliest actual occasion, though there is a specific difference between the nature of God and that of any occasion. Also the differences between actual occasions, arising from the characters of their data, and from the narrowness and widths of their feelings, and from the comparative importance of various stages, enable a classification to be made whereby these occasions are gathered into various types. From the metaphysical standpoint these types are not to be sharply discriminated. As a matter of empirical observation, the occasions do seem to fall into fairly distinct classes. 
The character of an actual entity is finally governed by its datum. Whatever be the freedom of feeling arising in the concrescence, there can be no transgression of the limitations of capacity inherent in the datum. The datum both limits and supplies. It follows from this doctrine that the character of an organism depends on that of its environment. But the character of an environment is the sum of the characters of the various societies of actual entities which jointly constitute that envy 169 Brahman, although it is pure assumption that every environment is completely overrun by societies of entities. Spread through the environment there may be many entities which cannot be assigned to any society of entities. The societies in an environment will constitute its orderly element, and the non-social actual entities will constitute its element of chaos. There is no reason, so far as our knowledge is concerned, to conceive the actual world as purely orderly, or as purely chaotic. Apart from the reiteration gained from its societies, an environment does not provide the massiveness of emphasis capable of dismissing its contrary elements into negative prehension. Any ideal of depth of satisfaction, arising from the combination of narrowness and width, can only be achieved through adequate order. In proportion to the chaos there is triviality. There are different types of order, and it is not true that in pro organisms and environment 111 portion to the orderliness there is depth there are various types of order and some of them provide more trivial satisfaction than do others thus if there is to be progress beyond limited ideals the course of history by way of escape must venture along the borders of chaos in its substitution of higher for lower types of order. The imminence of God gives reason for the belief that pure chaos is intrinsically impossible. At the other end of the scale, the immensity of the world negatives the belief that any state of order can be so established that beyond it there can be no progress. This belief in a final order, popular in religious and philosophic thought, seems to be due to the prevalent fallacy that all types of seriality necessarily involve terminal instances. It follows the Tennyson's phrase, Own that far off divine event to which the whole creation moves, presents a fallacious conception of the universe. An actual entity must be classified in respect to its 170 satisfaction, and this arises out of its datum by the operations constituting its process. Satisfactions can be classified by reference to triviality, vagueness, narrowness, width. Triviality and vagueness are characteristics in the satisfaction which have their origins respectively in opposed characteristics in the datum. Triviality arises from lack of coordination in the factors of the datum, so that no feeling arising from one factor is reinforced by any feeling arising from another factor. In other words, the specific constitution of the actual entity in question is not such as to elicit depth of feeling from contrasts thus presented. Incompatibility has predominated over contrast. Then the process can involve no coordinating intensification either from a reinforced narrowness, or from enhancement of relevance due to the higher contrasts derived from harmonized with. Triviality is due to the wrong sort of width, that is to say, it is due to width without any reinforced narrowness in its higher categories. Harmony is this combination of width and narrowness. Some narrow concentration on a limited set of effects is essential for depth, 
but the difference arises in the levels of the categories of contrast involved. A high category involves unplumbed potentiality for the realization of depth in its lower components. Thus, triviality arises from excessive incompatible differentiation. On the other hand, vagueness is due to excessive identification. In the datum the objectifications of various actual entities are replicas with faint coordinations of perspective contrast. Under these conditions the contrasts between the various objectifications are faint, and there is deficiency in supplementary feeling discriminating the objects from each other. There can thus be intensive narrowness in the prehension of the whole. Nexus, by reason of the common character, T combined with vagueness, which is the irrelevance of the differences between the definite actual entities of the nexus. The objectified entities reinforce each other by their 112 discussions and applications, likeness. But the 171 is lack of differentiation among the component objectifications owing to the deficiency in relevant contrasts. In this way a group of actual entities contributes to the satisfaction as one extensive whole. It is divisible, but the actual divisions, and their sporadic differences of character, have sunk into comparative irrelevance beside the one character belonging to the whole and any of its parts. By reason of vagueness, many count as one, and are subject to end and night possibilities of division into such epical tifold unities. When there is such vague prehension, the differences between the actual entities so prehended are faint chaotic factors in the environment and have thereby been relegated to irrelevance. Thus vagueness is an essential condition for the narrowness which is one condition for depth of relevance. It enables a background to contribute its relevant quota, and it enables a social group in the foreground to gain concentrated relevance for its community of character. The right chaos, and the right vagueness, are jointly required for any effective harmony. They produce the massive simplicity which has been expressed by the term, narrowness. Thus chaos is not to be identified with evil, for harmony requires the due coordination of chaos, vagueness, narrowness, and width. According to this account, the background in which the environment is set must be discriminated into two layers. There is first the relevant background, providing a massive systematic uniformity. This background is the presupposed world to which all ordinary propositions refer. Secondly, there is the more remote chaotic background which has merely an irrelevant triviality, so far as concerns direct objectification in the actual entity in question. This background represents those entities in the actual world with such perspective remoteness that there is even a chaos of diverse cosmic epics. In the background there is triviality, vagueness, and massive uniformity, in the foreground discrimination and 172 contrasts, but always negative prehensions of irrelevant diversities. Section 2 Intensity is the reward of narrowness. The domination of the environment by a few social groups is the factor producing both the vagueness of discrimination between actual entities and the intensification of relevance of common characteristics. These are the two requisites for narrowness. The lower organisms have low-grade types of narrowness, the higher organisms have intensified contrasts in the higher categories. In describing the capacity ties, realized or unrealized, of an actual occasion, we have, with Locke, T, 
tacitly taken human experience as an example upon which to found the generalized description required for metaphysics. But when we turn to the lower organisms we have first to determine which among such capacities fade from realization into irrelevance, that is to say, by comparison with human experience which is our standard. Organisms and Environment 113. In any metaphysical scheme founded upon the Kantian or Hegelian traditions, experience is the product of operations which lie among the higher of the human modes of functioning. For such schemes, ordered experience is the result of schematization of modes of thought, concerning causation, substance, quality, quantity. The process by which experiential unity is attained T is thereby conceived in the guise of modes of thought. The exception is to be found in Kant's preliminary sections on Transcendental Aesthetic, by which he provides space and time. But Kant, following Hume, assumes the radical disconnection of impressions qua data, and therefore conceives his transcendental aesthetic to be the mere description of a subjective process. Appropriating the data by orderliness of feeling. The philosophy of organism aspires to construct a critique of pure feeling, in the philosophical position in 173, which Kant put his critique of pure reason. This should also supersede the remaining critiques required in the Kantian philosophy. Thus in the organic philosophy Kant's transcendental aesthetic becomes a distorted fragment of what should have been his main topic. The datum includes its own interconnections. And the first stage of the process of feeling is the reception into the responsive conformity of feeling whereby the datum, which is an air potentiality, becomes the individualized basis for a complex unity of realization. This conception, as found in the philosophy of organism, is practically identical with Locke's ways of thought in the latter half of his essay. He speaks of the ideas in the perceived object, and tacitly presupposes their identification with corresponding ideas in the perceiving mind. The ideas in the objects have been appropriated by the subjective functioning of the perceiving mind. This mode of phraseology can be construed as a casual carelessness of speech on the part of Locke, or a philosophic inconsistency. But apart from this inconsistency Locke's philosophy falls to pieces, as in fact was its fate in the hands of Hume. There is, however, a fundamental misconception to be found in Locke, and in prevalent doctrines of perception. It concerns the answer to the question T as to the description of the primitive types of experience. Locke assumes that the utmost primitiveness is to be found in sense perception. The 17th century physics, with the complexities of primary and secondary qualities, should have warned philosophers that sense perception was involved in complex modes of functioning. Primitive feeling is to be found at a lower level. The mistake was natural for medieval and Greek philosophers for they had not modern physics before them as a plain warning. In sense perception we have passed the Rubicon, dividing direct perception from the higher forms of mentality, which play with error and thus found intellectual empires. 174 The more primitive types of experience are concerned with sense reception, and not with sense perception. This statement will require some 114. Discussions and Applications Prolonged Explanation But the course of thought can be indicated by adopting Bergson's admirable phraseology, 
sense reception is unspatialized and sense perception is spatialized. In sense reception the sense are the definiteness of emotion. They are emotional forms transmitted from occasion to occasion. Finally in some occasion of adequate complexity, the category of transmutation endows them with the new function of characterizing nexus. Section 3. In the first place, those eternal objects which will be classified under the name sensa, constitute the lowest category of eternal objects. Such eternal objects do not express a manner of relatedness between other eternal objects. They are not contrasts, or patterns. Sense are necessary as components in any actual entity, relevant in the realization of the higher grades. But a sensum does not, for its own realization, require any eternal object of a lower grade, though it does involve the potentiality of pattern and does gain access of intensity from some realization of status in some realized pattern. Thus a sensum requires, as a rescue from its shallowness of zero width, some selective relevance of wider complex eternal objects which include it as a component, but it does not involve the relevance of any eternal objects which it presupposes. Thus, in one sense, a sensum is simple, for its realization does not involve the concurrent realization of certain definite eternal objects, which are its definite simple components. But, in another sense, each sensum is complex, for it cannot be dissociated from its potentiality for ingression into any actual entity, and from F its potentiality of contrasts and of patterned relationships with other eternal objects. Thus each sensum shares the characteristic common to all eternal objects, that it introduces the notion of the logi 175 cal variable, in both forms, the unselective any, and the selective sum. It is possible that this definition of sensa, excludes some cases of contrast which are ordinarily termed sensa, and that it includes some emo qualities which are ordinarily excluded. Its convenience consists in the fact that it is founded on a metaphysical principle, and not on an empirical investigation of the physiology of the human body. Narrowness in the lowest category achieves such intensity as belongs to such experience, but fails by reason of deficiency of width. Contrast elicits depth and only shallow experience is possible when there is a lack of pattern contrast. Hume notices the comparative failure of the higher faculty of imagination in respect to mere sensa. He exaggerates this comparative failure into a dogma of absolute inhibition to imagine a novel sensum, whereas the evidence which he himself adduces, of the imaginative tion of a new shade of color to fill a gap in a graduated scale of shades, shows that a contrast between given shades can be imaginatively extended so as to generate the imagination of the missing shade. But Hume's X. Organisms and Environment. 115. Ample also shows that imagination finds its easiest freedom among the higher categories of eternal objects. A pattern is in a sense simple. A pattern is the manner of a complex contrast abstracted from the specific eternal objects which constitute the matter of the contrast. But the pattern refers unselectively to any eternal objects with the potentiality of being elements in the matter of some contrast in that manner. A pattern and a sensum are thus both simple in the sense that neither involves other specified eternal objects in its own realization.
The manner of a pattern is the individual essence of the pattern. But no individual essence is realizable apart from some of its potentialities of relationship.